Good morning. How are you doing? Great. Good, thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to the second tutorial in our tutorial series uh, in Phoenix uh, this year. Uh, this morning we have a very interesting, timely, and in my opinion, thought-provoking thought -provoking tutorial on incorporating artificial intelligence into healthcare workflow, workflow models. This tutorial is jointly sponsored by the Health Application Society, and I would like to thank the society for uh, nominating our speaker today. Uh, I have known Ting Long for a really long time, uh, so it's really, I'm very excited to be introducing Ting Long this morning. Um, Ting Long is a professor of operations management and business analytics at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. He is also a member of the leadership team of the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative. Ting Long's research interests span healthcare analytics, human AI interaction, global supply chains, and marketing operations interfaces. He has published widely in leading journals. His research has been recognized by many, many awards, and he has provided a lot of leadership to our society. His research has also been quoted in or interviewed by, the, he has been quoted in or interviewed by the media regarding his research. His co-author, Dr. Michael Abramov, is a neuroscientist, retina specialist, and a computer engineer. He is the founder and executive chairman of Digital Diagnostics and a professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Iowa with joint appointments in the College of Engineering. His research has been widely published and cited. So before I uh, give the microphone to Ting Long, I would like to thank uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Doug Shear, uh, the editor-in-chief of our tutorial series, and have him present our Thank you all for, for being here. And we're going to get a great overview in these tutorial talks but also there's a lot of detail, many, many references that are available in printed form. And I, I find it's sometimes useful to just go to a shelf to bring, bring out a book to scan things as opposed to kind of searching on the internet. So you have a wonderful resource in terms of this live presentation, but you, uh, this should be available, I'm gonna double check, at the Informs booth. It's a wonderful, wonderful asset to have, to have at your own home. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Abro, for the really uh, for, for for inviting me. I have a very kind and generous introduction, and yeah, it's it's an honor and pleasure to to be here. And uh, Doug, Doug, I I do have that uh, uh, hard copy. It's it's, um, it's it's fantastic, and uh, so it's in my office because I didn't want to lose it while traveling. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Phoenix. I think last time I was here was 2018. Uh, this. Place still feels much bigger than I thought, and <laughs> so I'm going to talk about how to incorporate artificial intelligence into healthcare uh, workflows. Uh, so as uh, Abro mentioned, so this is John work with Dr. Michael Emmermoff. Uh, so Abro has already talked a lot, a lot about him. So I'm going to skip the introduction, uh, but let's just start with this quote that I love to use uh, in my AI talks, which is technology is neither good nor bad nor is it neutral. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really up to us uh, how to use it. Uh, so in the next about 60 minutes, uh, or 70 or 60 minutes, uh, we will discuss the what, uh, the why, and the how of incorporating AI into healthcare workflows. Uh, just to start with the water part, I think I just look, just quickly scan the audience, you know, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of friends, colleagues. Uh, this is probably a little bit, um, uh, boring to you, so, so just bear me for the next 20 minutes or so. I'm c just quickly uh, going through um, some basics. So what's going on here in the past few decades, why we're here. So 1956 uh, at the Dartmouth College meeting, that's where the term artificial intelligence was coined that began the first AI boom. Then people started using AI to do all sorts of magical things but nothing quite happened. So by 1974, two decades later, the hit the bottom, the first AI winter. So then starting 1980, so that's the second AI boom. This is the period of time when philosophers, uh, psychologists, linguists, and dreamers work together to build expert systems. So this is the age of knowledge representation. By 1987, so it hit the second AI winter, 
1993, uh, 2011, this was a very interesting period of time. So I call it the AI spring in the sense that if you tell people your specialty is artificial intelligence, people will not think you, you are a scam. Uh, but on the other hand, people will not, uh, will not think you are doing something very special or very cool. People think it's just something as normal as operation research, as philosophy, um, you know, drama, or uh, political science, right? So that's uh, AI spring. So I started my AI journey actually during that period of time. So the period is wide enough. So, so it's hard for you to know how old I actually am. And so 2011 to present, we're in the third AI boom. So my prediction, also many other people's prediction, this is going to be longer than the first AI boom, hopefully more than 20 years. And the reason is because it has not just one milestone, it has multiple milestones. Starting with the so-called the deep learning revolution at the University of Toronto, they really uh, revolutionized computer vision uh, using convolutional neural networks technique. And AlphaGo Zero really uh, popularized reinforced learning. So now when it comes to informs, everyone is doing something related to reinforced learning. And, and generative AI, and uh, we have a DALI 2, DALI 3, uh, MidJourney, and now have ChatGPT, GPT-4, Google Bard. Uh, they are basically built on these ideas called transformer and also stable diffusion. And, but I would argue the most fundamental uh, trend, uh, the most fundamental milestone we see here is that we start seeing people incorporating AI into workflows, so, which I think is, is the most important. Uh, revolution is going on, and it will make this boom far more lasting than previously. It will also make AI very boring. And uh, in 10 years from now, nobody will be excited by AI just because AI has already been part of our life um, in, in a really deep, fundamental way. So a few AI heroes. I don't, for this audience, don't think I need to introduce uh, any of these people, but just give a sense that Herbert Simon um, was actually a very active member of this community and publishing OR, management science interfaces. Uh, in addition to being a uh, computer scientist and also economist, um, his AI was fundamentally rule-based AI, which is a symbolic AI. So whereas these three gentlemen uh, who actually started the deep learning revolution, their AI is basically learning-based AI, also known as connecting AI. So the difference is that if you trust the rule-based AI, you believe in all the rules, constraints, logic. If you believe in learning-based AI, you believe in using data to, to find out, identify clues, and so the um, computers learn from, from data patterns you have. Right. So clearly, uh, you know, I, I love Herbert Simon. Everyone loves Herbert Simon, right? Uh, but he has lost this battle and, uh, by now. So learning-based AI has dominated rule-based AI. You just look at all the keywords. People don't care so much about logic, program, constraints, or rules anymore, or theory anymore. A lot of stuff about learning, um, about data, about a network. Um, in particular, neural networks have dominated other kind of learning methods. And uh, so um, let me just show you the same timeline, just add some medical AI milestones. So medicine has always been a very important part of AI history. So new networks were inspired by brain science, right? So uh, during the first AI boom, there were quite a few uh, medical applications, including this paper, Warner et al. 964, the Bayes theorem to develop this AI to diagnose uh, continental heart disease. Uh, but a really, really superstar, really famous one was actually during the second AI boom, this expert system called Mycin system. They use about 60, uh, sorry, 600, actually 600 plus rules for identifying bacteria res response for severe infection. Now the current AI boom, so the hero is actually this uh, device called IDXDR, which became the very first FDA approved autonomous AI system in 2018. And this was not done by Google, but rather by Dr. Michael Abramov, who is co-author on this tutorial. Um, so now let's look at the, uh, the mycin. So mycin uh, is legendary, very influential. Uh, actually, Stanford, they did a study. They found it has uh, accuracy 65%, which is actually better than most physicians who are not specialists. Well, 65% may not look very high, but pretty good if compared to humans. But it was never actually used in practice. Very famous, 
uh, is cited probably thousands of people, uh, has a huge following, has never ever been used even once in practice. Wasn't it because the model wasn't good, but because of ethical and legal issues related to the computers in medicine? So basic question is, if something goes wrong with the AI system, who's to, who is going to be responsible? Will the doctor be responsible or will the computer be responsible? So, so this legal barrier actually turned out to be the most important uh, you know, factor behind its non-use in healthcare. Uh, and there are also other issues such as, you know, you have the issue with uh, extraction necessary message, but uh, mycin, uh, in the case of mycin, it's mostly due to legal issues, which we're going to touch upon later on. Uh, so that today, AI is a reality in medicine. Uh, because it is being used. It is being used more and more. Uh, like I mentioned, IDXDR, they recently changed the name to Luminex Core, so which is used for retinopathy screening. Uh, again, as I mentioned, so my co-author act was actually the inventor of this uh, device. And this was the first FDA-approved AI-enabled diagnostic device. Uh, at Hopkins, uh, we have we were, we were actually the first one to use it in pediatric setting. So this is Dr. Risa Wolf, who is my main collaborator uh, at for my AI research at Hopkins. Uh, just give you a little bit of background about diagnostic retinopathy. Uh, this is leading cause of blindness in working age adults. Um, so if someone has retinopathy, what happens is that you look at the normal eye, then you look at someone with retinopathy. So for, for this audience, so, so the best way of looking at it is that your retinop, uh, so your retina is like uh, your upper layer in artificial neural network, right? So if that upper up layer has something wrong, uh, then you cannot get that signal, right? So that's, that's the way we think about it. So it's a leading cause of blindness. Uh, so screening is very, very important because first of all, one in three diabetic patients of both types will develop retinopathy. That's number one. Number two is that we have 13, 37 million people in the U.S. have diabetes. Not to mention a lot of people have pre-diabetes. And this 10%, 11% percentage is almost universal across the world. Not just, you know, developed world or developing world. It's almost all the countries have a number similar to this number. And the black adults are 6% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes than white adults. Uh, so early detection and treatment can reduce the risk of blindness by 95%, uh, and only, however, only 15% of U.S. diabetic patients receive recommended annual screening. So 15%, so that number is actually, is lower than the screening rate in many developing uh, countries. Now, you may be asking why is that? Why, why is it 15%, not 50, not 60, or 70, 80, right? Uh, as in many uh, uh, developed countries. So the variety of reasons, uh, reasons are related to uh, you know, how complicated the healthcare system is, you know, transportation barrier, information barrier. And, uh, but regardless of whatever, what the reason is, we know of those, those patients who do not get screened uh, annually, 82% of them, they do see a primary care physician. So 82% will become, you know, the, where we can find the breakthrough, right? So if we could provide the screening where people actually see their doctor, uh, that, that could help, right? Um, now, just provide another uh, data points here. Is the current standard for diabetic retinopathy detection? Uh, this is the process. You need to see a specialist in a different building with a different arrangement, getting a different bill, and it takes two hours. So, with the AI device, it, take, it takes place in a primary care facility office. It takes less than two minutes, right? So, you just to compare uh, that lead time. Between, uh, you, you know, between someone needs screening and actually get screened down. Uh, current standard is two hours in different uh, setting. So RTDR really shortens that to two minutes in the same place. So uh, now this is just one of the many devices. So certainly I'm not setting this device, and, but there are many, many other devices. So 521 AI-enabled medical devices has already been approved by FDA for clinical use as last July. Uh, so the more and more devices are being approved any, uh, any given day. Uh, so as you could suspect, 75% of them, uh, more than that actually, come from radiology. So radiologists are really the AI champions in the field of medicine. Then look at cardiology would be the second. And a lot of areas such as dermatology, so far we have zero device has been approved by FDA. And for reasons you can 
probably suspect. Um, so there's still more to be done, 521 just really cut a very, very small uh, of, um, you know, proportion of medical fields. We have so much more to, to be done, and, and actually some of INFOP's members uh, either have already got the devices approved or in the process of getting approved. So uh, I think we can also contribute to make the number bigger. And most of these devices build on deep learning. So deep learning's idea is really because it's deep, right? It's deep, which means it's, it has hidden layers, but within each layer it has multiple neurons. And just through this really, really simple, really intuitive connection inspired by brain science, it can really mimic a very complicated behavior, nonlinear behavior. Uh, and if we actually add convolution layers, and the convolution layers really does do, really do the detective work, collect information, identify patterns, uh, and send that to a fully connected layers like we saw before, it really can, does, can do magic in terms of classifying images. So uh, as you could ex suspect, so medical doctors were among the people who were most excited once they saw the deep learning revolution took place at the University of Toronto. So they were actually the, among the first people who started looking at how to make better diagnosis using AI. So this Nature article uh, compare actually humans versus AI in terms of breast cancer screening. So they look at the mammogram, uh, mammographs, and then they look at human doctor performance, they look at the thin in based AI performance. So they draw the conclusion that thin in based AI beats human doctors in diagnosing breast cancer using mammograms. And there are a lot of other studies. This particular study is from dermatology. Um, they use biopsies to diagnose uh, skin cancer, essentially. Uh, they found a thin based algorithm achieved an AOC of 96% for melanoma. Now, for, for those who don't know, uh, AOC stands for area under the curve. So the curve is receiver operating characteristics curve. And if the area under the curve is 100%, that's a perfect diagnostication, right? So that's like the God. But, but if it's 96%, so it's not quite there yet, but, but it's close to perfect. That's, that's basically what we got here. Uh, now, so that's basically the quickly talk about the what. What does medical AI mean? What it's actually doing? Now, next question is why do we bother, uh, uh, you know, with medical AI, right? So I want to uh, quickly talk through a few things to see if I can convince you this is actually different. So this is not just simply replicating human expertise. Uh, so starting with IDXDR, uh, so same device, we have been doing this, have been using this for a series of studies. Um, so this IDXDR device generates this report. This report gives this result in terms of is this minor uh, retinopathy, major uh, retinopathy, or no retinopathy detected. It refers patients to see the specialist to get a final diagnosis, to get treatment. So you, you, so you see, this isn't really replacing doctors. This is actually complementing doctors. Uh, in, a, in a country like the US, when the screening rate is as low as 15%, if anything, it actually brings more patients to the specialists. Now, if, if a screen rate is 80%, that's a different story, but it's a 15%, so it's actually, uh, it, it might not actually, be you know, as scary as people thought. It's not really replacing uh, eye doctors. Um, this study was Johns Hopkins Pediatric Retinopathy Study using ITSDR and it was published in JAMA and a few other papers. Oh, sorry, this was Natural uh, Digital Medicine and a few other journals. So uh, first of all, this was doing real world validation, which is actually the first step in applying AI, is that it's not enough to just look at the top line numbers, you actually have to validate them. So it turns out that these numbers uh, are different uh, from the numbers in the FDA approvals, but that's because this was pediatric population, so which is a relatively low prevalence population. Uh, but also even that, the performance is comparable to human doctors. Uh, and, but the most striking finding, I personally believe, is actually these issues improve the patient adherence from 49% to 95%. So the comparison is the following. If you just, as a primary care doctor, if you tell a patient to be screened by a specialist, only half of the time they listen. Uh, if you actually show them a result from the AI device, so that adherence increases to 95%, almost 
So that, that is really dramatical effect really solves this information barrier I mentioned earlier. So information barrier means people either don't know the need to be screened, or if they know, even if they know that, they do not feel the sense of urgency. So this is really increased adherence uh, from 49% to 95%. The other study uh, was done recently uh, to look at the screening rate. Uh, if you offer people the option of AI versus not, uh, no uh, AI option. So this was uh, uh, a clinical trial, so two, we down into two groups. Group one was standard of care, so we refer patients to ECP, which stands for eye care professional, and provides education, provide, uh, provides all the resources and support, et cetera, even offer to have the medical appointments. So group two was a POC, that's point of care, uh, so where the care takes place, you offer the autonomous AI option. Uh, turns out that in group two, 100% consent rate. 100% of people got screened immediately, whereas in group one, you look at 22%. By the way, this is up for the fact that you give people six months, six months of time, and then call them and follow up to say, have you been screened? The turn of six months is not, not enough. I guess people still need more um, extension, right? Just like we have trouble with completing our review reports these days, right? Uh, but, but six weeks clearly, um, even we give six months, given the resources, you still only see 22% of screen. This is higher than 15% of screening rate with national average, uh, but this is still not good enough. So we are in the process of doing cost-effective analysis uh, but, but to really understand why AI provides something different from our modern doctors provide. So I, I think we need to understand the making of modern medicine. So this argument I want to make here is that, so think about how medicine was practiced in North America by late 1860s. So obviously nobody uh, was alive at that time, uh, but, uh, it just, but this book does a really vivid job of this, describing medical practice back then. Uh, so the point uh, can be summarized as anything and anyone can flourish in healthcare. All you need is to have this ambition, to have the passion. You don't really need any certification, any training, or you know whatsoever, right? So even if even those people who actually spend the time, spend money to go to medical school to actually uh, earn those uh, certificates. So most of U.S. medical schools were notorious medical diploma mills so at, at that time. So you may wonder, okay, what happened at that time? What happened at that time was that there was no modern medicine. So this was traditional medicine. There was no standard of modern medicine yet. So the way the medicine was practiced, according to this British cardiologist, David Mendel, who wrote the book called the Prop Doctoring. So I think I visited Cambridge uh, uh, earlier this year. I, I think one of the various colleagues told me that the proper is a very, very you know, British way of saying things, right? So in the US, we don't use the proper as much as uh, UK. So the prop um, doctoring talk about uh, on the art of a diagnosis, uh, says on the turn of a century, diagnosis was made by process of pattern recognition. So you basically, you try to figure out where the patient's symptoms match description you have from the textbooks. Of course, they don't perfectly match, right? So then you try to narrow down to so-called differential diagnosis. So that skill of diagnosis really boils down to how you are able to uh, reconcile uh, the differences between what you see and what's described in the textbook. So there's a modern medicine. Uh, there could be many, many um, uh, years, but the year I pick would be 1870. 1870 was a year we started seeing dramatic improvement in life expectancy throughout the world. Uh, so that made me believe a, a, about 1870s, roughly speaking, the beginning of modern medicine. Uh, yeah, if you just look at 1870, so the whole world, uh, we're looking at the life expectancy of below 30 years, and the North America uh, and Europe were just slightly better than that, right? So 1870 was a turning point. Now you might wonder, what happened to 1870? Well, Industrial Revolution, uh, you, you know, a lot of important advances, and in addition to all those exciting things, so medicine has, has changed uh, itself, right? So it has transformed itself in the sense that, so doctors no longer do the rely on heavily on pattern recognition. Instead, they started understanding the causes and the mechanisms. So medicine was no longer just medicine. Medicine was built upon physiology, uh, pathology, and really understand the causes and the mechanisms 
uh, that actually has made a lot of difference to how medicine has been practiced. So, so the prediction from Dr. David Mendel was that when we came to understand all disease processes, the pattern recognition approach will die out. Uh, because, I mean, let's face it, pattern recognition only gave us a uh, life expectancy of 30 years old, right? So that's clearly not good enough. Uh, but it just sounds really, really ironic uh, if you read the book in 2023, uh, because if you look at how AI works, at least most of the FDA approved AI devices work, it's 100% pattern recognition. So his prediction was that this pattern recognition is just no good, should be replaced by physiological approach. So this will never be, never come back. So, and you, you look at how AI has been practiced. Rule-based AI has been th basically thrown away, right? So I don't think people really care much about rule-based AI anymore. So learning-based AI now is actually the kind of AI people assume well, what AI means, right? Um, so, but if you just really, really reflect upon how we got here, so my prediction is actually that the future is not about disappearance of a pattern recognition, it's going to be a combination of a physiological approach, which physicians are good at, and also rule-based AI is good at, plus pattern recognition, which, which learning-based AI has been really, really good at. And we know that AI can see things better than we do in many cases. They can hear things better than we do in many cases. And we started having AI that can smell things, right? So the, that's pattern recognition. So if we could leverage the power of pattern recognition in AI, and that's going to have big, going to make a big difference to, uh, uh, to medicine, right? So now, uh, the, so Hopefully I have convinced you that what AI has offered is substantially different from what modern medicine has offered. Uh, it, it basically really brings out the good part of traditional medicine. Uh, but now I also want to show you some real world evidence AI can make people more productive because we don't really have a lot of real world evidence that AI actually improve productivity, right? If anything, we, we thought, you know, people thought ChatGPT happened last, last year. The whole world was going to was getting better, right? And so far, that we haven't seen that, right? Uh, and uh, instead, we, what we have seen is that we got a lot of emails starting with, I hope this email finds you well, right? And uh, so that's, that's, that's the result from ChatGPT so far. Uh, but we do have some real world evidence uh, that AI could increase clinical productivity. So this is a study we run in Bangladesh, recently accepted by MPG Digital Medicine. Uh, so we, again, we use the same FDA approved device and we did this uh, study in Bangladesh. The study was pre-registered, prospective, double-masked. So it's called a double-mask and not double-blinded because these people are very superstitious. They don't like blind. And uh, so it's a cluster randomized controlled trial. And so we did this at this place called Deep Eye Care Foundation. And uh, we, the study was designed uh, in the first year of a COVID-19 pandemic. But due to the pandemic, it wasn't around until March to July 2022. So overall got about a thousand patients, half of that in the control group, half in the intervention group. So this, both groups started with visiting AI first. Difference is that in the control group, AI doesn't do anything. So they, you see AI first, but then got it always sent to a specialist directly, regardless of screening results. So the intervention group, Patients start with a visiting AI system for screening and refer to specialists only if it results are positive. So we um, choose Bangladesh not because we cannot, uh, well, we choose Bangladesh actually purely for reason, uh, due to operational reasons. Actually, you will be very pleased to hear because of a curing theory uh, was actually reason we choose Bangladesh. So if you want to measure clinical productivity, so you need a larger potential demand and, you, and also patients, if they arrive with appointments, there's no way for to measure productivity. And if people schedule appointments two months, three months ahead of time, uh, you don't really see productivity improvement, right? Uh, you could, but it's going to be harder. So, but this kind of situation, high demand, no appointment, is actually pretty common in low and middle income, uh, income countries. In high income countries, uh, obviously it's true, right? So we choose this particular hospital because it has very large appointment demand. So we help us avoid recruitment buyers. And the paper, so if you, the paper actually published in MPJ, uh, which is a natural um, uh, digital medicine, is arguably probably the only 
or maybe the first paper in the journal actually has a curing uh, formulation. Uh, so we look at, we use rational curing theory um, to capture the idea that when the potential demand is very high, then you have administrator that try to adjust the volume of patients trying to achieve an equilibrium arrival rate that gives a reasonable congestion, right? So then without AI screening, then everyone will, will be sent through to see the specialist. With AI screening, a proportion of them, they get negative screening results, and that, uh, so they ask to go back in six months uh, to, for follow-up, whereas the group get positive results, so they, in this case, they actually see the provider, and so we measure the total productivity uh, in the system, which is patients who see both AI and uh, the specialist, and that's the, our measure of productivity. So we found the overall productivity uh, increased uh, 40%, and we use AI augmented healthcare, which means given the same number of specialists, given the same resources, you can see 40% more patients and potentially prevent 40% more patients from getting blind you know, in, you know, in a down the road. But more importantly, we found an increase in the mean complexity score of patients requiring specialist encounter. So the control group, we look at a complex score about one after six. Trim, uh, intervention group, that's 2.8 after six. So which means specialists, they can focus their time and attention on more complex patients instead of uh, every patient. So if you adjust complexity, we look at the productivity, we found a 265% increase in uh, specialist productivity. Now this isn't uh, the clinical productivity, this is just productivity of the particular specialist because now they're seeing more complex patients. Okay, so that gives the, uh, the why part. So uh, AI is different. The reason we need a medical AI is because they are different. And also we have a very limited resources and they could help us uh, uh, in, uh, in improve our productivity. So next portion, I want to talk about the how part. So, so we say, well, AI could help, it's different, it's not just replacement of humans, it offers something different. Question is how we are going to actually utilize that to make that a reality. Uh, so I want to start with this observation that if, if you ask people, which company is the biggest player in the space of medical AI? Um, you'll be hard pressed to think of one company, right? So the digital diagnostic is big, but it's, it's nothing compared to really big tech companies. Uh, so we haven't really achieved the status in which one company has monopoly in medical AI, not even uh, AI for specific medical conditions, specific specialties. So I call this uh, a medical AI hasn't achieved its iPhone moment yet. So we have a lot of things going on and it's just people haven't quite figured out how to use them in a way that is really, really usable, right? Uh, so the answer I believe lies on fact is, of course, the answer is it's too complicated, right? There's so many different layers, players, from delivery to financing, innovation, and policy making. Um, so we found, uh, so, I, so this, is, this framework was actually done with Sri Dr. Yeo of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So we've, we've identified four key drivers. So we call the four pillars of incorporating AI into healthcare workflows, including the physician buying, patient acceptance, provider investment, and also payer support. So let's start with the patient acceptance. And um, so a lot of study already exist show that patients can be resistant to medical AI for a variety of reasons. So, so this journal of a consumer research paper found this uniqueness bias, meaning that people who think they are unique and uh, they tend to reject medical AI. And uh, so because they may overrate uniqueness of their circumstances. And then you have the issue of AI and trust in patient-physician interactions. So we're actually doing research on this line. Uh, but you could imagine if you see a doctor who uses ChatGPT to help with diagnosis, how you would feel, right? Not to mention uh, in this question a lot of doctors like to ask is that, would you like to see a doctor train on Reddit, right? So uh, actually, ChatGPT relies heavily on Reddit, uh, that's social media data. Uh, would you like your doctor to be trained uh, 
by Reddit instead of medical school, right? So that's the question. So even if it might give you pretty good results, so the trust issue we, we simply cannot ignore. And also physician buy-in, uh, have been working with my marketing colleagues, so, so Shuban should think, we have written uh, one paper a few years ago, look at that physicians use AI extensively, maybe deemed as have low skill or redundant skill by, by their peers, and the physicians will use computer-based diagnosis tools are frequently regarded as inferior diagnosticians by their peers and by patients. Uh, and this effect is true even for AI ex experts. Yeah, so, so even AI experts don't want to see a doctor um, who, use AI, who uses AI in, in, in a diagnosis. So um, not to mention legal liability in, uh, implications. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, my reason my thing wasn't widely wasn't used at all was due to legal liability uh, implications. So uh, let's just just dive in. I guess in the next 15 minutes, I'll dive into the liability issue. So this, so this is a, a paper. Uh, I have a QR code here. If I, if you're curious, um, so this is the paper. Uh, um, working paper will look at the theory of when and how physicians use AI by considering malpractice liability. So we know malpractice liability is always a central consideration in medical decision making. This is with or without uh, AI. And so the potential for AI use can increase or decrease the liability. So I will explain why. And that implication can change physicians' endogenous decision as to whether to use AI or not. So, so that's, if that sounds too abstract, let's put this into specific context. So this, so this JAMA article was co-authored. Uh, uh, so the first author, uh, so, he, so he, he's, he's, he has done a lot of work about law, AI, and law and medicine. And so they look at this, this particular uh, case that a physician who prescribes a treatment plan for a patient, the physician can choose either standard or non-standard treatment plan. So a plan is standard if it follows the standard of care. Uh, in the case of this ovarian cancer treatment, it's about a dosage. So the dosage for standard plan is 15 milligram per kilogram body weight uh, for patient every three weeks. Whereas non-standard treatment plan is more aggressive. It's 75, five times of a standard treatment plan. Uh, so the current standard of care is very conservative. Uh, so that's why it's 15, not 70, uh, 75. So now, if you are a doctor, you are deciding between 15 versus 75, uh, you are probably, you probably want to do 7, 7, 15. The reason is that uh, the physician is liable if you, if you do 75 and something happens. Uh, we need both conditions to be true. The physician deviates from standard of care and the patient harm occurs. So the implication is that the physician is shielded from liability if they follow the standard of care. So, so this was a case study uh, from this JAMA article, uh, 2019. Um, we actually draw our analysis upon this uh, liability analysis. We build a game theory uh, model, and we're in the process of testing this in the field. Uh, but just to recap what's going on right now is that in the current practice, the physician is liable only if a physician does non-standard treatment and the patient outcome is bad. And that, that's the prevailing liability scheme. Now, once you bring AI into the picture, it gets complicated, right? Because here you have AI says, physician says, well, physician decides because the physician is the one who eventually chooses the plan. Now we start, suddenly have eight different cases, depending on what the AI says, what the physician says, right? And you, uh, yeah, also patient outcome, two by two by two, we have eight cases. So this becomes very complicated. Now, uh, how are we going to make sense of this? First thing we know is that if the outcome is good, nobody should be upset, and the physician shouldn't be liable, right? So that alone allows us to reduce the number of cases by 50%, right? So we have made huge progress. And, and then we have really three cases left. Among the three cases left, if you look at the first case, the first case says AI says standard, physician does standard, patient outcome is bad. So it's only reasonable if the physician is not liable, right? Because it's like the whole world says you should go with 15 and you 
go with 15, and something terrible happens, right? So uh, we should just get rid of that case. So we have three cases, three remaining cases. So if you look at these three remaining cases, you start seeing something interesting. Uh, eventually, depending on your philosophy, depending on what's your guiding principle in liability determination, you are going to draw very different conclusions, right? So, so if you think the standard is a standard, let's just keep the standard, you have one, one kind of scheme. Uh, or if you think AI is really good, you think of AI as the new standard. So if you don't agree with AI, you may be liable, right? So that would give you another liability scheme, right? Um, so it turns out that a lot of people actually think that way. So this, uh, uh, this is actually very influential, very popular AI textbook by Russell and Norvig. Uh, pretty old because it published in 2015. And it says, in designing medical expert systems, the actions should be thought of not as directly affecting the patient, but as uh, influencing physicians' behavior. So physicians are actually under customers because physicians actually decide when to use AI and how to use AI. And expert systems become reliable and more accurate than human diagnosticians. So doctors might become legally liable if they don't use recommendation of expert system. So if AI says standard, you do the opposite, or the other way around, the physician should be liable according to this uh, discussion. So that means uh, the physician is liable if AI says standard, physician says non-standard. Or the other one, if AI says non-standard, physician says stand, that's standard. But AI, physician is not liable if AI recommends non-standard treatment plan and the physician chooses non-standard too. So that's, that's basically this liability scheme. So if we analyze Russia and Norvig scheme, uh, we can get one set of results. Now, not everybody agree with that, for, sh for sure. The other, legal, uh, the other school of legal thinking holds that we should just stick to current standard of care. We use AI just to reinforce, reinforce that standard of care. So whenever a physician deviates from standard of care, uh, AI signal provides that alert that could trigger additional liability. So in other words, if AI says standard, physician does non-standard, the physician not only liable, but more liable, right? Because here AI actually says standard, which reinforces what's already standard, right? On the other hand, if, if AI says non-standard, physician chooses standard, physician is not liable because standard is still the standard, right? So third case is that if AI says non-standard, physician does non-standard, physician is still liable, because again, we stick to the current standard of care, but, but hopefully less liable because you can use AI signal as proof to show you the court to justify less liability. Now, these are the two liability schemes. These are the only two plausible liability schemes we know so far. So we analyzed both uh, and we found something quite surprising. So first of all, we found uh, that physicians may use AI for low uncertainty cases. So for cases, they are pretty sure what to do, and they, they are willing to use AI, whereas they might avoid using AI for high uncertainty cases. High uncertainty cases are the cases they're not sure what to do. They don't want to use AI. They don't want to use AI because AI may, might disagree with them. If AI dis disagree with them, they could be more liable. So I, I call this uh, you know, parenting advice dilemma, and so as a child, if you ask your parents for advice, but then you, do, you don't follow that advice, and something happens, you'll be liable f for life, right? Uh, it, it actually makes sense for you not to ask for advice. Just do it, right? And, and then you, you are still liable, just less liable, right? So, so the, um, as the, that's number one. Number two, uh, as the precision of AI improves, you would think everything will get better, right? Everything should get better. What we found, not necessarily the case, as AI gets better, the physician's tendency to avoid AI in high uncertainty cases can be amplified, right? So that's really a mouthful. So, uh, but the point here is that as AI gets better, as that parent gets smarter, 
their children actually more hesitant to ask for advice in difficult situations. So the intu intuition is the following. As AI becomes more precise, all else being the same, when patient harm arises, the physician is more likely to have deviated from AI recommendation. Why is that? Because now AI is better, right? So AI is better. Something you deviate from AI advice, you have a better outcome, more likely than not, AI has told you the right answer. So, that, so that's a key reason uh, that could prevent people from using AI even when AI gets better. The other part is that as AI gets better, you're less likely to just dismiss AI. You're more likely to take AI seriously. But what if you don't want to take AI seriously? So then you shouldn't use AI in the first place, right? So, so we apply, we did a little bit of strategic thinking to this, but we thought uh, these are the testable uh, hypotheses that could, could uh, test it uh, either empirically or in the lab. And so I think we have, yeah, we still have like half an hour, right? That's a very generous amount of time. So let me just quickly talk about a few lines of ongoing research. So this may be just too many bullet points, and uh, really just two slides. So let me just, hopefully I, I spend a fair amount of time talking about this. So some of my ongoing research with our colleagues here, uh, uh, you know, within our community is actually to look at a service design problem. So the very first the problem I studied exploring was optimal sequencing. I think Shim Rita, uh, think, not just Shim is here, but we, we look at the optimal sequencing, which is, if you have a system in which a patient can see either AI or physician, then should the patient see AI first or see the physician first? Now, you may ask me, what's the difference? Well, the difference could be right, uh, could be coming from many sources. It could be that if they see the AI first, that's the first signal. So that first, first signal could, could, could be the anchor, uh, and then they, see the, uh, uh, then they see the physician second, so the physician may be influenced by the anchor, in that anchor adjustment process, which is a well-known uh, psychological process, right? So there could be quite a lot of difference about optimal sequencing and depending on patient risk profile and also depends on operational characteristics. So that's optimal sequencing problem. And then we also have optimal configuration problem for AI augmented gatekeeping. So this one is with uh, Michael Freeman and uh, Jato Dean, so both of them at the INSEAD. So uh, yeah, so Michael, is, uh, they are based in, uh, in Singapore. So this was really inspired by Singaporean uh, diabetic retinopathy screening system. So which actually, they actually, uh, well, first of all, they already have a very, very, very high screening rate already compared to the mirrorable 15% screening that we have here. But, you know, Singapore, uh, they're not satisfied. They're basically saying, what happened to that 10% patients who hasn't been screened? And so they're saying, what about AI? So they're saying that if, if AI can make things better, why don't we just try AI? So they try to decide whether you should use a uh, pure AI system or pure physician system or hybrid of AI physician system. And that configuration itself, it has already been uh, studied uh, with a very large amount of data, uh, but we will look at it, we thought there's quite a lot of things that when we look at it more carefully, we get very, very different findings. And so the third part is about the disclosure of AI use and the patient and physician trust. So this one is actually with Dr. Risa Wolf and He Yang. Well, he Yang is a marketing uh, colleague. Risa Wolf is a medical professor, uh, a medical colleague I have at Hopkins. So we, this one is actually a study we are running with Hopkins physicians. We really choose a group of doctors and uh, ask them, uh, ask them serious questions about their trust for particular providers' quality, uh, depending on if they use AI and if they disclose their use of AI. So, so the trick here, here is the following. Um, certain kinds of AI, there's no way for it to hide. So like IDXDR, the kind of medical device, if you use it, people are going to see it. There's no way you can hide it. But then you also have AI, such as a software algorithm embedded in electronic health records. So people use AI all the time, just like we use Google all the time. You know, we use ChatGPT all the time, right? Not, not everyone, but we, we, we more or less use ChatGPT in some ways. And that kind of AI 
may not be disclosed. Your doctor may be telling you, I just need to go to my office to print the report. So then they go to ChatGPT, right, to, to, to double check your case. And should that kind of AI use decision be required to disclose? So, so the disclosure obviously is a very, very well-known topic in accounting, in marketing, and in our field as well, and broadly speaking, information economics. But in the particular setting of AI use, it introduced new dimensions. So not to mention trust is also very, very new topic in healthcare. Uh, so our fields, we have a lot of experts in trust, but most of the studies about trust is about uh, buyer, seller kind of trust. So do or supply chain partners trust uh, between each other. But in terms of uh, uh, trust between a patient and a physician, it's very subtle. Uh, it's, it's, it, people don't know exactly what trust actually means. I think the most famous definition is that you believe your doctor is acting in, a, in your best interest. So that's, that's the standard definition. Um, so it's not about intention. So, so your doctor may not be um, altruistic uh, at all, but you believe they are going to act in your best interest. So that's the definition of a trust. But even that definition isn't, it, it, I mean, it reveals a lot of more things, more questions than it answers. So I think this is one area we can also explore more. And last one is the patient incentives and willingness to use AI. So this one is a survey. So this one is actually uh, a survey among diabetic patients. So with actual diabetic patients, we ask them their willingness to use AI for their screening decisions. Now, this is different from the patients we have already talked about in uh, Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. These are the patients who are already actively monitoring their health, you know, they have become members of American Diabetic Association, and they are actually very much engaged, committed patients. Uh, so for these patients, they are actually already seeing their eye care professionals. And the question is, are they willing to use AI uh, in addition to, to that, right? So here, the angle we look at is actually patient incentives. What kind of incentives could be useful for them to use AI? Uh, and also, um, now the other part, uh, we're looking at incentive and policy uh, design. Uh, so with ELOD uh, uh, data, so this is very, very, much ongoing work, we're actually still, still modeling this, but uh, this is a look at physician reimbursements for using generative AI. Uh, so, so the question here is become really tricky because if you use generative AI in your practice, so which introduce a different uh, variety of um, issues, uh, especially in terms of precision and also development of effort. So uh, let me give you a little bit of context. So a lot of academic medical centers are actually using generative AI in medical practice. So at least exploring the use of generative AI. So Johns Hopkins has subscribed to this offline, unfiltered version of ChatGPT. They have this contract with OpenAI. Uh, this really is an opportunity for people to use uh, GPT without uh, breaching the patient confidentiality and privacy, uh, but then, uh, it does introduce additional cost, right? You need additional time, additional training. So the results actually crucially depend on prompts, right? When you think about why we get so many emails, it says, I hope this email finds well because the prompts they use were, were terrible, right? And so actually prompts are very, very important. The, the, the raw materials are very, very important. Uh, so it has a lot to do with their own contribution and how do we compensate that? So that introduces a whole set of new issues. So the second uh, topic we're looking at is actually about biased algorithms and physician liabilities. By, by that, what I meant is that if I have an algorithm that is biased, it has different accuracy levels for different kinds of patients. Uh, it, it could have a high accuracy for white patients than for black patients. So under the current uh, human uh, health and human services regulations, it's illegal for a medical doctor to use an algorithm that discriminates against the patients, right? So if your algorithm gives different results of, uh, for different uh, type of patients, that is uh, technically you might be penalized. Although in reality, I don't know how it's actually being enforced, uh, but this is a real issue. This is about the discriminative uh, 
concern and how that affects the physician liability. So we are actually uh, analyzing this. We're trying to draw broader general, uh, you know, implication, but I just give you a very quick preview. preview. The one of the findings from this study was that uh, under this kind of liability scheme, developer may be incentivized to develop AI software with lower, uh, lower precision for all the patients, not just for one, but for all the patients. So, um, for example, uh, you have one case where you don't have, a, have this kind of liability concern. In equilibrium, you're looking at accuracy of 90% for white patients, 80% for black patients. Now, after you have introduced this liability, you, you are, could be looking at 17% accuracy for both types. So it's actually universally worse for both type of patients. So this is where being analyzed. So the third line work I look at is actually look at the FDA approval process. As some of you have, may have uh, suspected, so once a, a, a medical AI device has been approved by FDA, you have to lock in your algorithm. You, you basically have to freeze it for a few years. And now, what if you, you update uh, your algorithm? Well, this is not your iPhone. You cannot just update it, uh, your operating system. They have to go through the same process again uh, to get a new data, to get a new approval. So it's, it's very lengthy. So completely different from so-called continual learning idea. So they do this for obvious reasons. They don't want the algorithm to be updated all the time and the patient harm might happen. Uh, but we thought the process is a little bit too rigid. And so FDA, they, they also know it's very rigid. So they have proposed different uh, regulatory innovation approaches. And so we thought this is one area one could look at. So I, I actually want to, uh, want to stop here and we have, uh, we have to do a little bit of uh, discussions. Just very curious, very excited to hear what you may be thinking. So I want to say may AI be with you and maybe may health with you. And with that, I want to th thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Ting Long. That was very, very interesting. Okay, we welcome questions at this time. Uh, thanks, Ting Long. It was very interesting. I'm just curious uh, about how physicians are learning the, the proper way to use AI. Are you starting to see AI being incorporated in, in medical schools and classes? Uh, is it the vendors teaching the, the physicians? Or are they left to figure it out on their own? Or, or how are they getting the information about the proper use? That's, that's a very, very good question. Thank you so much. So I, at Hopkins, I'm a co-chair with this group called Johns Hopkins, work, work group on AI and healthcare. Uh, so almost half of this group actually are physicians who use AI in their practice. So now if I ask people, how do you get started with AI? Well, usually they start with a mentor or with a colleague who has been using it for a while. Uh, and so they get exposed and started trying it. Um, I'm not aware of a lot of formal training. Uh, so I think they started learning uh, how to use AI, just like uh, we learned to do, to do machine learning, reinforcement learning, right? And basically by observing and by trying different things, different options, but I do, I do definitely see the need for them to get a formal training uh, in AI, just to understand uh, how AI models are developed. Uh, you know, you talk about vendors, actually, and vendors actually are known as headaches in hospitals, right? Because uh, all the doctors got so many, you know, sales pages every day. There's no way for to determine whether this tool would work or not work at all. Uh, you really have to rely on your network uh, to see whether other people are using it, whether this is actually real world performance. Um, but, but one thing I do want to say here is that what I've found really, really inspiring is that in the medical community, they really insist on testing AI systems to identify real world performances. So they may not know how actual the algorithm worked, how it's designed, but they, they believe in the power of a randomized controlled trial to do the studies I have presented here. You know, you have one group with AI, the other group without AI, try to look at the real world performance. I, I found that part to be something lacking in non-AI, uh, uh, non-medical AI fields. Um, very inspiring talk and sharing and I have a question and I heard a lot of discussions about um, the AI uh, helping to make decision because with the deep learning uh, structure most of the time we can't tell the 
or like the thinking process of the AI, how it comes up with certain decisions. And without that clear mm -hmm. pathway to explain the AI to make certain decision or recommendation, how the liability can be shared among like the AI and the physicians in your opinion? That's an excellent question. So we look at, for example, we look at all the studies using the AI can get even better performance than humans, uh, but that's one condition. So you have to believe that your, doc, your patients are average patients, right? And uh, you are looking at average condition, right? So all those numbers are for uh, average patient, right? Uh, so if something goes wrong, that's where the trouble starts. And this is not just unique to medical AI, to all sorts of black box AI. Uh, they are very brittle, and if something goes wrong, you go back to that neural network, look at those weights, look at the model, there's no way you can see what happened. Uh, when humans make mistakes, or uh, use, use these kind of rules, a uh, rule-based AI, you could uh, go back to check where things went wrong. Um, so that, so I think this is actually a central challenge here. We, we really cannot just use AI to replace humans yet, uh, especially for high stakes scenarios. So I do think, think AI can be very, very useful for screening, for example, the screening um, in really resource constrained setting. So if we, you are looking at 15% screening rate, that's mirror but low, the baseline is very low, and also AI has already been shown to have very good real-world performance. I think this is where we can use. On the other hand, I do think it's actually ethical for someone just to write a uh, few lines of code, build a model, and start it, deploying it, especially in, in the developing world. Uh, I, I think that's really unethical for the reason that you, they haven't been quite validated, haven't been proved uh, in the field yet. So I, I would say that the two things. Number one is that we, we should still insist on um, uh, make sure humans are in the loop and make sure the f uh, subject matter experts sign off things, right? Like when Boeing, their airplanes are designed and manufactured, they have experts who sign off to say, well, this is safe. So this is, this is safe to fly. Um, how come our self-driving cars, you don't have people to sign off, right? Our medical devices, you don't have people to sign off. So I think that responsibility, accountability should be there. So the subject and medical experts should be there to make sure they're safe. But more importantly, we should make sure we test all these AI products in the real world, so not just in the field, in the real world, by looking at all the nuances, all the complications, also accountable physicians may uh, you know, uh, adhere to or not adhere to. AI recommendations in their practice uh, to really see how they actually perform uh, re relative to our current uh, standard of care. Thank you very much. Very Thank interesting you. presentation. I have uh, actually two questions. Sure. One regarding, generally, they're reticent against this black box telling things, and mm -hmm. it was really interesting to sh see these uh, more physiological approach, like a gray box approach. How do you see this will sort of increase more this openness of what happens inside the AI and uh, so the physician can really feel that it's doing something he understands. Mm -hmm. And the other aspects regarding liability, that's my second question. It's how in this matter the insurance company, because uh, physicians are looking at their insurance and uh, that's what's gonna help them in the case of a malpractice sue or something. Uh, have you heard something about the insurance company and how they react against these yeah. uh, new technologies? So uh, I will start with the second question. So it's, it's, the answer is relatively simple because to my best knowledge, I have talked to you know, all these people. Like, now, Nicosian Price is like a leading figure in the field. Uh, he has come from, so far, no doctor in the US has ever been sued for using AI in their practice yet. Right? But doesn't mean we're not happening. So, but that's the value of doing theoretical work is that we carefully analyze and we can use that to guide legal practice. Uh, but in terms of insurance companies' reactions, certainly, again, they haven't seen a real cases being, uh, 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 you know, being actually uh, happening in practice, but definitely we're preparing for that. Right of options. One option is that you talk about insurance, I think the different kind of insurance is that they are talking about AI insurance. So this is not a healthcare insurance, but this is, this is an insurance company who actually provide 
uh, kind of like Apple Care, right? But this is like insurance for a product. If something happens, this insurance covers liability um, that could be incurred to the physician, right? So that's one of many things. I think New Journal Medicine published an article about it, uh, and quite a few people actually doing some analysis about it uh, in our field as well. Um, back to your first question, this is gray box approach. I like the concept. So idea is that if you don't like a black box approach, but you were not that ready to go back to the rule-based AI world yet, and uh, maybe something in between. Uh, I, I think this good idea is a good idea if we could build on expert, uh, ex expertise we already have. Why do we assume the whole thing is a black box? Actually, pro the reason is that we already have subject matter experts who already know a lot about uh, how the diagnosis should be made. We should be able to combine that expertise with this kind of black box model. So uh, I teach uh, artificial intelligence class at Johns Hopkins. So my students are MBA students. They were shocked to learn that ChatGPT doesn't know about grammar at all. ChatGPT actually started training, learning from a lot of texts. You know, this attention mechanism. Their question for me is always, we already know grammar, we don't know, know tons of stuff about you know, semantics, uh, why don't we just tell the machine uh, how, how the words should be organized, right? So we should be able to do that, combine rule-based AI and black box AI, so that's, I actually think that's the future, if you ask me. Uh, but I do want to caution against a lot of so-called gray box idea. They basically start with a black box model and then try to build another black box model to make sense of that black box model. And saying, oh, hey, we have this uh, black box model, now we can make sense of it, uh, we can interpret it, so that it can create an illusion of interpretability without actually being interpretable. So I think one of our uh, informed colleagues, Cynthia Rudin, is actually is one of the strong uh, opponents of this kind of uh, so-called explainable AI. Well, it's good to make AI explainable, but you don't want to create explanations that also are hard to explain. Thank you for the great talk. Obviously, this is a very interdisciplinary uh, topic, especially I'm interested in the accountability part. I wonder, first of all, um, is there, do you see any opportunities to work with our colleagues in the law school to actually discuss what are the theoretical foundations for rigorously showing accountability in case there's a, a future law change? And secondly, if you have the chance to talk to an actual political leader, what would you say in terms of changing our laws, maybe providing a safe net, safety net for physicians to use more AI? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. So first of all, we need to talk to them. And so, so the lawyers, uh, they are just as curious as we are uh, because they haven't seen a real case yet, right? So everything is theoretical. And we are very good at doing theory. And uh, they are, yeah, so, so Nic Nicholson Price was a spoker at, uh, you know, our, work, our Johns Hopkins work group on AI healthcare uh, of speaker event. He actually just spoke last Friday. And uh, so we, we are talking with the lawyers. Actually, I'm going, I, yeah, I go to law schools to give talks in addition to our own, uh, you know, engineering and business schools. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to interact with them to understand what they are thinking. And certainly there's a lot of things to be studied from a total law perspective. But the liability determination itself is not just about a, a legal community, also about uh, you know, economics, right? You have this law economics community and our field now is getting into a lot of hot button topics, right? Look at the ESG, for example, sustainability issues, a lot of legal liability related problems. I think we should really think of this more broadly as a part of ESG, and because this is about being responsible, being sustainable, uh, not just you know, uh, have another really noble tools without worrying about actual consequences, right? So, but generally, broadly speaking, think about the accountability, uh, just based on my conversation with a lot of lawyers, a lot of people, I actually believe we should just treat medical AI just as any AI other medical technology. Not more harshly, not more linearly, just the same. Um, really just insist on the safety, insist on efficacy, and insist on real world performance, evidence. Uh, we, we, we should never, you know, think of them as something special and we just because they have 
perform, you know, promise, and we treat them differently. Now, that also related to the notion of iPhone moment I mentioned earlier. So you think about why so many big tech companies are not really strong players, like Google. I don't think anyone knows Google in this space. So Google also try to develop because they're not screening AI. Their, their AI is still being approved, still haven't been approved by FDA. Um, so bigger, bigger companies can have even deeper pockets. If anything, they worry more about their liability. Uh, and I think this is probably contributes to the diversity of the field. You see so many small players actually are thriving. So I, I think we should cherish this moment and uh, to, to have more players, not so the field is not dominated just by a few big tech companies. Thank you, Ting Wang. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.